Okay, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Max Gulhane. Before we start, I'll give you a quick update about what's happening in Albury, New South Wales, where I'm based. It's been a great couple of weeks. I've been on a farm tour again with good friend and regenerative farmer, Jake Wolke, and we walked around, we toured the farm, we talked about the parallels between human health and ecosystem health and animal health and drew drew an interconnected picture and we emphasized that locally sourced high quality animal food is key in in my mind to to good health so we also have had um some a great feedback from a recent interview with dr anthony chafee uh, that covers a bit about my background so if you're interested in uh, a little bit about how I've come to where I am and my current thoughts about health and disease, which obviously are continuously evolving, then please check that episode out. We are now talking again with Dr. Jack Cruz, and in this is a continuation of a series that I'm doing with him on light, water, and magnetism, which are essentially the foundations of Dr. Cruz's perspective on what is driving chronic disease and, and how um, and what is uh, interfering with optimal health. So episode one was all about light. It was about the evolution of mammals. It was about uh, how light interacts with our cells and our mitochondria to either produce health or disease. So I'd highly recommend checking that, that episode out before watching this one. This episode is all about water. It's about um, mitochondrial water and we talk how we jack explains how when the water in the mitochondria the ability of the mitochondria to make water is impaired then disease is something that manifests so fascinating discussion we've already recorded uh part two of water that i'll be releasing in the, in the next couple of weeks uh so thank you for engaging and watching it's been a very very interesting and uh journey uh just talking to dr cruz and learning so much from him so if you are interested in this topic, I would also recommend following his Patreon where he has gone deep with a, 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 a massive amount of written information in the form of blogs that covers and summarizes a lot of what we've talked about in the last three hours and this one and a half hours. Uh, so highly, highly recommend that as a resource for those who are interested. Also, um, going forward, if you in, enjoying the content, please subscribe and leave a review on the podcasting platforms. Uh, that would be helpful as would sharing the podcast with your friends and family to help uh, raise the profile and help educate more people about the importance of light in health. So onto the podcast now. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, look, looking forward to engaging with more of you uh, in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cruz, thanks for coming on again. No problem. Cool. So, so give us a bit of an idea about what, how you think about about water, because the, the lay person, as far as they're concerned, um, you know, we should drink a certain amount of water. You know, water is something that can give us electrolytes. But in your bio, your biophysics model of an understanding of health and disease, water means so much more than than just that. So, so maybe give us a, an idea about that. Well, the way I like to think about it is almost like a Broadway play. If you look at what's going on in a cell as a Broadway play, water is the medium message and mode of actually how life gets to play out. Without a water, there is no life. So that should bring you, you know, when you make a statement like that, it sounds hyperbolic. Um, but when you sit back in your chair and, and go, yeah, you know, nothing grows in photosynthesis without water. And as we talked about in the last podcast, when we talked about light, <clears throat> the entire food web on planet Earth comes from water um, and light. So in third grade, everybody learned about photosynthesis. Um, that's where you take CO2 and sunlight with water to create sugar. That's not controversial at all. Everybody gets it. But what's interesting in any of the sentient beings that are on the planet, that includes plants and animals for me. I, I don't ascribe to the vegan way of looking at things that, you know, only animals are sentient. I think when you eat a piece of kale and you bite into it, yeah, you create a DC electric current injury. Um, and yes, that is a signal 
that that plant is alive. Um, and that signal cannot exist without water. Um, but the real interesting part is I like to use the analogy. And for those of you who watch this on YouTube, you'll see what I'm doing now. It's a spider doing push-ups on a mirror. Um, photosynthesis is the spider on the mirror. Oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria is the spider inside the mirror, mirror imaging photosynthesis. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, everybody knows what photosynthesis is. We just laid it out in its base. But everybody seems to forget that mitochondrial respiration is the mirror image of photosynthesis. In other words, it takes sugars, breaks them down into CO2 and water. In other words, the same thermodynamic givens that come in, come out. So that should be, sorry about that, Max. That was the wake up call for me to call you and start this podcast. Um, the interesting part about this mirror image, uh, if you're a black swan mitochondriac, you got to ask yourself, are the thermodynamic givens actually the same? And you're going to find out that it's actually not. The thing that's different in mitochondrial respiration is the creation of water at cytochrome C oxidase, which is the fourth cytochrome in mitochondria, where there's four red light chromophores, creates water through uh, a process uh, of oxidative metabolism, which is predominantly the TCA cycle in complex life. Now, I think everybody knows that there's other ways for us to metabolize, but it turns out the TCA cycle makes more water, more ATP, than if you metabolize glucose. Uh, and we know that from uh, reptilian studies on snakes who, who have a very specific diet that mimics, you know, what I tell mammals to eat, which are uh, proteins and fats. Why? Because the water content that you create from your mitochondria is brisk. So what's the main difference in... Um, water created from oxidative metabolism, which occurs inside the mitochondrial matrix, it's deuterium depleted. So when you see that, you go, okay, if I know the water inside us is deuterium depleted, first question is, why is nature doing that? Because remember, nature never makes mistakes. There's always a reason for what she's doing. And then the second interesting thing you need to ask yourself is the water in the mitochondrial matrix homogenous for the rest of the body? Or are there different compartments in the body, you know, that we learn biologically that have different fractionations of deuterium? And if so, why is that the case? And then when you get to the level that I got myself into 15, 20 years ago, is you realize that biological compartments, the things that Max and I learned about in medical school, like intracellular versus extracellular space, physics has another term for them. Those are called space-time domains. And that quantum leap that I just ask all of you to make, it's not something to run away from and be scared of. The reason why it's interesting to think about compartments inside a cell from a space time domain, it tells you that different versions of reality can show up in different parts of the cell, even when you're looking at this Broadway play from a cell component. And it also brings into focus why circadian biology is so important, because you have to have accurate clock time mechanisms when you think about compartments from a space-time continuum. So, the easiest way to unpack this whole 80,000 foot idea that I'm trying to give you is that what happens, say, in the circulatory system on the exterior and our skin is radically different than what happens at the aorta. And then let's even break it down further. It's radically different than what happens at the glomerular and F, uh, uh, membrane and kidneys. It's radically different than what happens in the portal circulation. It's radically different than what happens at the hypothalamic. Uh, portal circulation. It's radically different than what happens in the brain where the arterial arcade is radically different 
than everywhere in the body. And then it gets even crazier when you really start to parse it out. And some of the things that I really like talking about, which is like the anatomy of the retina. The anatomy of the retina has some really unusual uh, findings in terms of how the circulatory system runs and the fact that the most metabolically active portion of the retina doesn't like the TCA cycle. Most people are stunned to find out that the Warburg metabolism, the thing that Max and I learn in medical school is really bad mojo and that's what cancer runs on. Turns out the human retina loves the Warburg metabolism. So when you hear these disparate pieces and then you listen to some of these idiots on other podcasts tell you that, well, the Warburg metabolism is only about, you know, cancer. This gives you an opportunity to start to question and parse those beliefs of those people and say, say to yourself, well, if the retina that has a very specific uh, function, especially as we learned in the last podcast, why is it using a, a Warburg metabolism, not the TCA cycle to do the things it does? Because that's a fair question. And you'll see ultimately that the answer you'll come back to is going to be the first two legs of the stool that we talked about. It's actually has a lot to do with light and it has a lot to do with water. And as I told you before that water is really the stage that life plays on, you have to realize that a stage and a play is nothing without the actors. The actors in, in this idea, this picture that I'm trying to paint for you, is light. And light manifests in water. And light changes the physics of water. Like most people who are listening to this podcast, probably the first time have never heard me talk about water before, will be their, their experience with water is very much like everybody else's. Comes out of my tap. It's H2O. I learned about it in third grade chemistry. Uh, and that's the extent of what they know. They think it's a homogenous chemical. You're going to find out probably today that that is total horseshit. Um, that is the, the, the third grade way of understanding water. That is not how water acts on, even on earth. And how it acts inside a cell is absolutely a stunner. Uh, the, all the different things it can do. And the way in which I like to take people who don't understand the true physics of water and how it changes with its environment, the best way to do it is to, to have the, an idea, a mindset. Uh, that I developed a long time ago when I started to study water. Because when I studied water for the first time, there was no books out there that were specifically dedicated to water. You had to go into the literature uh, and read a lot of um, things on not only the biologic aspects of water, but also the physical aspects of water. <clears throat> and some of the physics stuff is really, really difficult to parse. For most people today, it's actually much easier to understand because there's been some water researchers out there that have written books that have taken some of the more difficult physical concepts, put it into print form like you were, you know, um, probably a mindless child and you could read it and go, oh, I get this. This makes sense. And you'll hear a lot of people when they talk about water, especially in other podcasts, um, try to use the simpleton version that you'll read in some of these books to explain it. I, I like those books because they help people understand water fundamentally, but there's a couple of times you have to step on the gas pedal and there's a, a couple of people that you need to bring to the table to let people understand that this person hasn't gone far enough in their experiments or in the way they characterize water, and that there's other people around there that have done more out there. Uh, we touched on that a little bit last time uh, when I, I told you one of the key things that I had to go through to figure out water is I, I actually looked at what 
the charge separation of water was for the first step of photosynthesis. Because to me, like if photosynthesis is the first step in the food web, I need to understand what the hell's going on inside of a plant. And I told you that when you did the mathematics, it's 12.06 volts, which puts you in the soft X-ray range. Well, everybody knows there's no soft X-rays coming through the Earth's magnetosphere to get to terrestrial leaves or algae in the sea to create, you know, hydrogen, oxygen, and two electrons, because that's effectively what charge separation of water does. And when you understand charge separation of water is how all life begins, then you got to ask yourself, okay, what is biology doing with H plus? What is biology doing with O2? And then this is the big one. This is the big one that I think everybody in biology shits the bet on. What's the point of those two electrons? And see, that gets to kind of what we talked about last time. That gets to our friend Albert Einstein, the photoelectric effect, semiconductive circuits, and all that. Um, and water opens the doors to all the things that you need to begin to question in biology. Water is a fascinating topic. You'll be happy to know. I don't think it's that difficult to understand. Now, some of you may be going, you've already blown my mind with what you've, you've just said, but it's really not that difficult to understand. I think the single most important thing to take away from this initial introduction is realize that water is not homogenous. Water changes its physics based on the environment that it's in. And this is the reason why it's special. Uh, it's special for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it has a lot of queer findings, meaning if you look at the physics of water, it does things that it shouldn't do, but that's because it's predominantly hydrogen bound. And it turns out hydrogen bonding is another key to understanding what water is capable of doing. The Probably the take home for the people who are more physics bent is that water allows life to do the things that life can do. And when you see the physical change in water at different, at not only different scales, but also different space time, then you begin to understand that water is, um, the best way to think about it is an electromagnetic capacitor, which means it's a battery, but it's only a battery in the sense when light hits it. And it turns out different light has different effects on water. So the way I like to think about it, since I'm a neurosurgeon, and Max will probably understand this really good and, and maybe decipher it for you guys in the show notes at the end, like he did last time, is I, I the brain is somatotopically organized in, in different parts. We have what we call a motor homunculus. We have a sensory homunculus. Um, I will even tell you that the retina has a somatotopic organization for water and for light. And it's the first place where those things come together. And believe it or not, it has a lot to do with the somatotopic organization of what goes on in the brain. This is the reason why when I look in someone's eyes, I know exactly where to look for the melanin problem, you know, that's deeper in those tracks. And I'm fortunate being a neurosurgeon, I happen to know all those tracks because I, that's my job. I need to understand that stuff. And, um, the brain also has some very, very unusual uh, arrangements with water. I mean, Max can probably talk about those again later in the show notes, but we have something called the circumventricular organs. You know, everybody learns about them in medical school, but very few people ask the questions that hopefully some of you began asking yourself. Say, why is it that, you know, there's five, six areas in the brain that have no blood-brain barrier? You know, we always hear that, the brain is a highly protected organism, but why is it that water comes to the surface in those specific areas? And what makes those areas special? Well, you're going to find out the reason why is those are different space-time domains in water, and water is being asked to do different things in the central nervous system. And when you 
you think about the brain, and I'm sure Max can can back me up on this. It's another interesting organ because it's filled with water. That water is called CSF, which is cerebrospinal fluid. It's also surrounded by water, okay, which is called the subarachnoid space or the peel layer that's below the dura. And the reason why I like to call it brain water for people who don't really understand the anatomy is realize that 90 three, I should say 98%, 98.9% of CSF comes from uh, the water in blood. And remember that blood is made up of 93% water. And when you see that, I'm throwing these numbers out at you, you'll notice that it's not 100%. It's not 80%. There's very specific numbers tied to this. And the reason I say that is not to show you that I'm a really smart guy. It's to actually get you to say, what is nature doing? And I guess this is the take home for you with water. I want you to have a beginner's mindset when it comes to water. I want you to ask the questions that a third grader will ask, because I believe when you understand water, hopefully the way we're going to talk about it, um, you'll realize that you need to comprehend water the way nature shows it to you. And then you will see our bodies use water the same way that you experience water in nature. The problem is most of you don't realize that the experiences that you've already had with water, either in the sea, a lake, an ocean, uh, are something for you to pay attention to. And then look at what's happening in the body and say, this is kind of interesting. I'm seeing some of the same things that I see in the salmon in the stream in our own body. Why is that? Ask that question. If you get to that point after this podcast, then that'll make me happy. Why? Because then you're on the path of the black swan. Um, that you are going to take the paradoxes, the ambiguity, the enigmas that are present in biology, and you're going to begin to ask good questions. That's how you solve problems. And the way you solve problems is because good questions always lead to more questions. And that allows you to take paradigms down. That allows you to begin to understand what the edge of knowledge really is in medicine and biology. And then you go after their sacred cows. That is, is really how I think people need to understand water. Yeah, fascinating. Um, the the key point that you made there that I think most lay people who have no understanding of this perspective on water will be that your mitochondria, which again are the power, so-called powerhouses or sites of, of um, energy production in the cell, they are reversing this process of photosynthesis. And as part of that process, they're actually making water. Um, and that, that is a very interesting concept because people have heard, you know, statements of, oh, the, you know, body is 70% water, you know, these glib statements, but they're not actually appreciating what you've said, which is that the production of water and a specific type of water, not just any water, but a specific type of water is, is occurring within the organism. So but what you, you just said something. But you just said something that I think before we jump in, we need to parse out, okay? You just said that everybody always hears 70% water. Let me tell you, that's a sacred cow we need to go after, okay? Turns out that's not true. So <clears throat> when Max crawled out of his mother's vagina, Max was 80% water. Max right now is probably... 70% water because he's probably 30, 32, 33 years old. Uncle Jack is 60 years old. And guess what that means for me? Jack is only 55% water. So the first question for the water podcast, why does young life in mammals have higher percentages of water as the molecule in them? Older mammals have less. So here comes your first mitochondrial lesson. It has to do with the heteroplasmy rate in your mitochondria. In other words, the engines that create water in you become less efficient over time. 
Whose idea was that? That's not Jack Cruz's idea. That's Doug Wallace's idea from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia from 50 years of research, you know, that he began back in the 60s and 70s. And we now know definitively, you know, that water is created by the mitochondria in multiple steps and multiple areas of the TCA cycle. So realize that the immature mammalian human brain requires more water to work than the old fart that's sitting in front of you in this YouTube video. Uh, so that's that to me is the first sacred cow. And each one of you who listen to this podcast needs to start writing these key features of water down and then explode them for yourself. Yeah, so mitochondrial heteroplasmy. Um, again, let's let's define that for for the listeners because uh, it's it's a it's a quite a big word, but it is relevant for diseases and perhaps the also it's very relevant for water. diseases and water. And and the likelihood that we manifest disease is going to be the degree to which we have um, a, our mitochondria heteroplasmic. So, Jack, how would you? distill or explain the concept of heteroplasmy? Well, this is probably the one area you'll probably hate me because I default right to physics. It's the thermodynamic efficiency of the mitochondria, meaning how good is the, the heat engine inside of you? When you're really young, it's supposed to be really good. When you're really old, it's not. And generally, the rule of thumb that at least Doug Wallace has laid out about every decade of life, we lose 10% efficiency. So I just told you we go from about 80 to 55% just with aging. It turns out that that 55% goes down even further if you have disease with aging. And even if you have disease without aging, it goes down. So he basically says that the level of heteroplasmy determines the disease you get. It means it's the disease phenotype that you get. So the reason why this concept is really interesting is because he says, if you can increase your mitochondrial efficiency, thereby increase your production of water, disease can vanish. That is definitively not something that me and Max learned about in medical school. That, that is concept number one. That's the implications of mitochondrial heteroplasty. But that's great news for a guy like Max whose name of his podcast is the Regenerative Health Podcast, because he's going, so production of water is big. And Max is probably pounding the table now going, this is the reason why y'all need to eat all your, your steaks and, and protein and fat, because they make more water than if you're a vegetarian or a vegan eating plants. Max is absolutely right. Carbohydrates only produce 55 uh, moles of water when you break it down in the same units, like if you ate one mole of glucose versus say if you ate one mole of fat, you would produce uh, about 105 um, um, equivalents of water. So it's double the amount. So from a thermodynamic efficiency, when you think about food, um, fats are the highest quality of macronutrient in terms of water creation for the body, proteins being number two, and then carbohydrates being number three. Unfortunately, you learn about Uncle Jack. He hates macronutrients because food for me always comes down to electrons and protons. So I'm going to drag you to that level. But again, there's a water beginners podcast. We just explained to you how water scales to food how it breaks down, and how different foods create more water. That's important for people to know. And yeah. now you also know that mitochondria also create water and that water seems to be related to disease generation, regeneration, and health. Uh, and generally, when life is good, uh, life is not encumbered by the environment, um, Young babies tend to be very, very healthy, very robust. They're basically a goob of fat and a bunch of water. And that should begin to make sense to you 
with what Max and I just laid out. Why? Because the babies, human babies, as we talked about in the first podcast, are radically different than their chimp cousins. They're born with immature central nervous system, uh, and they have a ton of sub-Q fat. That sub-Q fat is turned outside the body when they're in the environment, hopefully in the sun, so that they can take that fat, turn it into massive amounts of water, so they can grow their immature brain into a real brain. Chimps don't have to do any of that. Why? Because they're born with almost a fully functional central nervous system. This is the reason why they have no subcutaneous fat. So you just learned a lesson again from mammals that are closely related, but radically different because of how they process fats and how they create water and why they're creating water. This focuses right back to what we just said about the human brain before, that the human brain likes a lot of water inside of it and around it for a reason, which I'm sure we'll parse out later. So again, these are all baby steps that we're trying to create for the listener to understand how incredibly important water is. Yeah. And you you heard it here, folks, about the the biophysical and the biochemical reason why a uh, almost highly meat based, fat based diet is is better for you. And Dr. Jack just explained that, which is the degree to which your body is able to make um, this type of important water is maximized compared to to carbohydrate consumption. I want I want to make a comment about the mitochondrial heteroplasmy and one of the sacred cows. Or, or medical dogmas that we got taught was uh, that diseases are genetic and the overarching paradigm under which a lot of um, disease and research in, in modern the modern paradigm is centered around is it's a genetic condition. This is a genetic condition. That's a genetic condition. Um, or the, the most obvious illustration is cancer and the fact that we've been looking at these somatic mutations of cancer to kind of uh, every explanation is is one of a genetic mutation, but what Dr. Cruz is is implying and suggesting is that it's it's far more important about our environment and the concept of mito, uh, mitochondrial heteroplasmy really speaks to this concept of uh, genetics loads the gun, but it's your environment that's actually pulling the trigger, and specifically the your amount of mitochondrial heteroplasmy is the degree to which you're going to manifest disease that you may have had uh, a predilection or, or um, a uh, uh, degree of, of, um, of exposure to. or, or um, So, so the, con- the, the really important idea here is that, um, drawing back to water, is that the de- what, what I'm hearing, Jack, is that our body's mitochondria's ability to make water is the fundamental point uh, long-term as to whether we're going to develop a, a disease. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I think I think that is actually pretty accurate. I mean, obviously, we'll have to get deeper into the story, but I think there's a good stopping point to giving somebody an idea of actually how this works, because all of us have this experience that I'm getting ready to tell you that shows you how axiomatically true what Max just said is key. And what that should do for you is realize that you have to question everything in the centralized paradigm when I give you this next story. So in the 20th and 21st century, humans got the ability to leave the magnetosphere and go above the earth. That started with the Russians in 57 with their first satellite, happened with Skylab um, that, you know, fell back to earth in 77, part of it actually in Australia. And, uh, and now is characterized in the International Space uh, Center, which I call the ISS for short, in case I mention it later. But a couple of years ago in the United States, most of of people in the States will know the story. I'm not so sure people in Australia do know the story, but it illustrates Max's point. We have two astronauts go by the name of Kelly. That's their last name. Um, one of them happens to be married to a senator who got shot in Arizona, um, and they're identical brothers. So identical twins, meaning their DNA is relatively the same. <clears throat> they were both parsed out on Earth before they went up in space. 
They sent one of the astronauts up into space. He stayed up there, I think, for 340 days. Uh, when he came back, what did they find? They found out that he aged far faster than everybody expected. And they found out that his DNA was hypermethylated. Okay. They also found out that he, he didn't create as much water from his mitochondria. And then he had changes in his retina. His optic nerve was pale. There was retinal changes. He also had numerous amounts of body complaints. You know, what Max and I would call disease. Okay. And they were magnified because they happened in 340 days. The reason why this is important for you to hear, what you need to understand about this story is not the details that, you know, Scott Kelly put in his book. You all can go read that. That's not important for this story. What's important for the water story is realizing that when you go outside the Earth's magnetosphere, the sun becomes a non-native EMF. Why? Because it's not being filtered to terrestrial sunlight. You're getting the full force of the electromagnetic spectrum when you're in ISS. And what is the effect? It dehydrates you. So what does that fundamentally tell you right away about water? That we create water in mitochondria from a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're not designed to make it from all parts. And that should be teleologically um, very, con uh, very, very neat uh, package for you to understand because we did not evolve at the ISS level. We evolved on the surface of the planet as light has been cut down to this very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum called the visible spectrum that goes from 250 to 760 nanometer light. That turns out to be the most important part that mitochondria are paying attention to. So that's number one. The second thing that Max brought up that I love is that this is an example of a modern human who had his environment changed dramatically in 340 days and developed disease like that. That tells you axiomatically that Dr. Wallace's idea that heteroplasmy rate can change like this, it doesn't require 10% every decade. 10% every decade is something we used to see on the surface of the earth when we were dominated just by the visible part of the spectrum. So hard stop again. Uncle Jack just said something in between those words. Since 1950, we're no longer dominated by the visible spectrum. Now we're dominated by how Max and I are communicating right now. I've got, you know, an infrared A light on, you know, that I'm sure you can see because it's early in the morning where I am uh, and it's nighttime for Max in Australia. We're talking over, you know, an internet that uh, has blue light, has RF, has microwaves, you know, has various frequencies in it. All of those things are dehydrating me and Max to get this information to you. So effectively, we are doing the same thing that Scott Kelly did to himself when we went up to the ISS. And in fact, some of you may say, okay, Jack, did you just say that when I go to work and put my computer screen on, that I'm doing the same thing? You're damn straight. That's what I just said. Every single time you use any type of non-native EMF, you're effectively turning on a switch in your mitochondria your mitochondria is designed by nature to be an electromagnetic capacitor to sense the environment, to create CO2 and water to, for you to organize your life. And it turns out that if that environment is so varied, it's going to affect the heteroplasmy rate. It's going to affect your disease metric. This is the reason why disease metric in Australia are radically different than they are in the United States. It's also the reason why the United States is different than Europe. It's also the reason why there's changes between the aboriginals in Australia and, you know, the people that are Northern European. And there's also differences, you know, in Africans and Asians. Um, biology that, that Max and I were taught want you to believe that the difference is genetic. It turns out that's not the big difference. And I think we parsed that out in the first podcast when I told you that when Clinton was president and Craig Ventner did the Human Genome Project, 
we have the same number of genes as gorillas and apes. That right there should have been a full frontal assault saying, hold on. We all thought that, you know, we're the, you know, the penultimate mammal on the planet, you know, that took the, took over for the dinosaurs, but we're no different, you know, than monkeys that are behind cages in zoos or in the jungles of Africa. And that should get you to question how really important genes are. People like Richard Dawkins do not and will not like this podcast, okay? Because we are parsing out for you that the sacred cow that you really need to go after when you're a black swan mitochondriac, it turns out the other genome in your cell, which is the mitochondrial genome, is by far the most important not the nuclear one that has DNA and RNA. And I'm not trying to tell you that your genome's not important. I think I told you in the last podcast that genes basically only code for proteins. Proteins should be thought of as semiconductive uh, pieces and parts. They have to be constructed with other atoms surrounded by water to do the magic that they do. Today, what we're discussing is all the different facets. And I, and I think the way to think about water, really, as a third grader, is like a diamond. It has so many different facets of what it does. Um, probably the best way to think about it in terms of how we just described the water is water is an amazing communicator. It, it actually is um, a translator, like Google Translate that allows Apple to talk to Microsoft. And I think about water as the Wi-Fi carrier, meaning that the sun comes to us 93 million miles away. It's filtered down to this visible spectrum. Water is able to decipher those electromagnetic codes and do something useful with it inside cells. Now, the cellular organization is critical in terms of what can and can't be done. And this is borne out in the work of Doug Wallace, but it's really brought home in this example that I I wanted to bring to your audience with the Kellys, because when you begin to understand that you can age much faster when you're in different environments, that gets you to realize that it's not the genes that are important. It turns out it's the mitochondrial genes that control energy production that are critically important to get right. And when you make that leap, like when Max asked me at the end of this podcast, what's the big take home? The environment and your mitochondrial heteroplasmy are the thing you need to function in on. Don't worry so much if you have uh, a mitochondrial, uh, I should say a, a, a genetic problem. Why? Doug Wallace has been on tape saying that he believes that uh, genes only control maybe 10, 15, 20% of the problem. Jack Cruz is on podcast saying that I believe it's less than 1% to 2%. That tells you that I don't think the nuclear genome is the big story. And, and that is paradigm shattering when you think about diseases like Max brought up, which is cancer. That makes me, you know the heretic, or, you know, if if I was being untactful here, um, the crazy MF or, um, but when you hear, oh, well, you could, you could look at it either way. I just, I I think that the key thing is when you do a podcast like this and you lay these concepts out as we're laying out, I think the listener can say, wow, I need to start thinking about diseases a little bit differently than what my doctor does because, my doctor has been taught that RNA and DNA is the key metric that I need to follow. And, and, and the funny thing is, many doctors don't even know that the mitochondria has its own genome that only has 37 genes. And it turns out, out of those 37, 13 are critical to make all the cytochromes that make our energy in our cell. Like the things that doctors believe are axiomatically true, like what creates the the five cytochromes, those 13 genes? Well, you got to ask yourself, if I just told you 
But Scott Kelly went up in space and he faced the full force of the electromagnetic spectrum and he came back hypermethylated, dehydrated with all kinds of, you know, diseases. You got to say to yourself, what happened? What yeah. happened to his mitochondria? Yeah. Well, that's a story that NASA, my government, will never let you hear because yeah. they don't want you to understand that the environment changes things because some of you may start asking really good questions like, why am I using a microwave? Yeah. Why am I putting a cell phone up to the side of my head? You know, why, why is Google the most valuable stock on the planet? And why does everybody want an iPhone? Because those are questions you should be asking yourself when you understand the first two legs of the stool, which is light and water. Yeah. And I, again, want to emphasize that the, the phrase that genetics loads a gun, but environment pulls the trigger. And why it's, I believe it's so important to, I guess, kill that sacred cow, as Jack says, is that so many patients that, that I've come across and I see um, have this idea that their condition is not going to get any better because they have a genetic predisposition, that they're somehow doomed genetically to a life of disease and it's something inevitable and it's something that they can't change. What, what the message that Jack and I are giving you is that um, this is an environmental thing and your, the, your likelihood of manifesting disease is under your control because you can control the factors that are determining your mitochondrial heteroplasmy. And, and the key one that, that Jack has just talked about is non-native electromagnetic fields or non-native EMF. And what the Kelly experiment point that Jack just brought up why that is so interesting to me and so I think fundamental is that it shows that um, you can you can go you can see immediately that um, not exposure to these EMF frequencies that we didn't evolve with is causing uh, is axi as you said axiomatically causing disease because the moment we put someone beyond the protective blanket of our magnetosphere and and the and the, the human um, protective magnetosphere, then we're manifesting all this disease and the mechanism is because that of that increased heteroplasmy. So what are the things that are causing... Well, the other, the other thing, Max, hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing, Max, not to try to interrupt you, but I want you to get this flow also. In between the words that we're saying to the audience, they should also stop and say, wait, Jack said hypermethylated. Um, they may not know what that means. That's not important, but one of the things that they probably do know there's functional medicine doctors out there, naturopathic doctors that specialize in, you know, methylation problems and things like that. They'll try to tell you, oh, you need to use supplements and this and that. Remember, there's no supplements for Scott Kelly in space. So you should immediately say to those people trying to sell you supplements, because remember, those doctors are doing the same thing that me and Max get pounded on in allopathic medicine that we legislate through the prescription pad, they legislate through their supplement pad. And it turns out that you don't really need supplements if you understand that the environment, as Max said, is the thing that pulls the trigger. In other words, light and water form the epigenetic toolbox that actually determines how the gun is fired. And it turns out how the gun is fired actually is what turns on and turns off the nuclear genome. See, we just developed for you with light and water, really fundamentally from an 80,000 foot view, how the cell really works, not what you've been told from allopathic medicine, not what you've been told from the functional medicine guys, not from what you've been told from the naturopathic people who tell you to take herbs and do all this stuff. I'm not saying some of that stuff doesn't have some clinical value, just like I'm not trying to tell you that sometimes antibiotics don't help you when you have septic shock. What I'm trying to tell you is that you need to understand the basics in you and how it works and that the epigenetic toolbox of light and water is incredibly important to get right, far more important than you've been led to believe. Yes. And again, for the listener, remember what epigenetics is. And, and Jack mentioned hypermethylation. So epigenetics is a changes to the DNA that occur 
and that if affect the expression of that DNA and, and the turns genes on and turns genes off. So, so the process of exposing doc, uh, the astronaut Kelly to this incredible barrage of, of effectively non-native EMF from an unprotected, unfiltered solar radiation caused these epigenetic changes to his, his genome and impaired his mitochondrial function. So he manifested disease in a highly, highly accelerated manner. To, to get that, and what does that mean from what does it mean from the water standpoint? Let's bring it back home. He made less water. Let, we're going back from the child, eighty percent, to Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly likely made less than fifty five percent water when he was in the ISS, and that's the reason why diseases showed up in three hundred forty days that didn't show up. And this is the key: his identical twin on the ground on terrestrial Earth did not have these changes. So the the implications of this thing that happened for all of us in the world to see is that Richard Dawkins is an idiot, okay? That's really what it means. If you're a neo-Darwinist and you truly believe that the selfish gene hypothesis that he wrote about in the 70s, this tells you it's absolutely fundamentally false. Okay, it's a sacred cow you need to go after. It means that you need to understand really how mitochondria work because of this change in water. And that's the reason why I call my tribe black swan mitochondria. It's black swan meaning they're rare. I know, Max, I've heard in, in Australia, they're not that rare. Um, but in the States, they're very rare. And we ask questions that other people don't seem to ask. And mitochondria, because the more you understand how those 37 genes and those 13 genes that control the cytochrome proteins work, you'll begin to understand, you'll come to that next level. You'll say, okay, I need to understand light better. I need to understand water better. Because when I understand those two things, then I can understand my disease better. I can understand the holes in what my doctor's telling me, both not only from advice, but also from the things that we prescribe in clinic. And that's the whole goal um, for me as a, a surgeon. I'm trying to educate my patients why my decentralized paradigm is radically different than the centralized paradigm that changed me. It's fundamentally because some of these paradoxes that Max and I have laid out over the first hour, we've decided to stop and ask the questions. We've decided to go directly to nature and comprehend nature in her way, and then copy her. If we do that, we are doing things correctly. That's how we're designed to work within the visible spectrum. It yeah, and, and it goes so much deeper than just an intellectual criticism on Richard Dawkins. Like, let's look look at this clinically. It this this model of disease implies that using a therapy for a specific mutation in say cancer is much less important and targeting that with a drug is much less important than the environment of which that patient's mitochondria are functioning or not functioning. And particularly- Max, you you know, you know, the, the statement that I always use, I'm sure you've probably heard in other podcasts that you can never get well in the same environment you got sick in. Now you understand hopefully why I axiomatically always repeat that over and over again. And it's a full frontal assault, even to some of my members, because they always get told, if you don't change the environment you're in, you're not going to get better. I mean, I, I, I'm i channeling people right now who I've told to move out of certain parts you know, of the country. Like I, I just found out actually when I was on vacation between our podcasts, that one of my naturopathic doctors, who's been a member for 10 years, died. Um, And I think the reason he died, I don't have all the details yet, but this is a guy that for 10 years, he was a paying customer of me, and I told him he needed to move out of Southern California because I felt that this was going to lead to an early death. And this guy, you know, was built like, you know, a rugby player, an NFL player. And it turns out he wound up dying of a, a, a 
a gastrointestinal cancer really fast. And apparently he told some other people. He never contacted me. And I, I think I almost hate to say this. I think the reason he didn't is because I had told him consistently for 10 years he was making a huge mistake. And I think because he had knowledge, he was a naturopath, that he never squared what he was learning from me with what was in the books. And ultimately, he looked in the mirror all the time and saw this facade and he's like, I'm good. I can handle Southern California. And it turned out Mother Nature kicked him straight in the ass. Yeah. The reason I bring this up is not to point out anything other than you have to question yourself. Once you understand the concepts that Max and I are trying to lay out for you, realize that you are subject to the same laws of nature as kale, as a lettuce, as a monkey, as a rhinoceros. You are no different just because you have a Ferrari engine in your head. In many respects, when you consider what I said in the first podcast, you're at a detriment to those animals. Why? Because the thermodynamics of this and this here, your heart, actually puts you at a huge risk. And this is the reason why when Max is in his clinic, he's seeing people die of brain diseases and heart diseases much earlier now than when I was Max's age. When I was Max's age, nobody died, you know, that was young from heart disease and, and neurodegeneration. Now we've got people in their 20s coming in uh, with these problems. Why? And it, it makes total sense when you understand the paradigm that Max and I are trying to lay out. Why? Because our environment in 2023 is radically different than it was in 1900. It's radically different than it was in 1930, radically different than what it was in the 1950s. And what we are taught, like I, I like to give this example, Max, and I don't know if you know it, but in 1900, I learned when I was back in medical school because I had some old guys teaching me uh, that colon cancer was the 37th cause of cancer in the United States. I, I And when I graduated uh, residency, colon cancer was the third leading cause of cancer in the United States. So when you hear that and you learn the Richard Dawkins, the neo-Darwinist or the Darwinist way of thinking, tell me how it is through natural selection that literally in a hundred years, we can have that rapid change. Hey. Remember, it's supposed to be small little changes over time cause these problems in genes yeah, that it, doesn't fit with their no, it's not explainable by their, their their framework correct and and the reason i bring this up is that's the old that's the old experiment that i used to go over with my patients to get them to understand this now with scott kelly this is even better why because we just shrank disease from 100 years to 340 days yes and and the point is that you can get the exposures that Kelly's having on a reduced scale if you're exposing yourself to non-native EMF underneath the protective blanket of of the magnetosphere. So and and what Jack mentioned is microwave, um, but all other forms of non non-native EMF. So um, you know five five G four G um, Bluetooth Wi Fi. These well, are let's just parse Matt. Let's par par let's parse it out. You just said something, and again, I apologize for interrupting you, but every time you say something that I think is going to help the audience understand water, because that's the focus here, let's talk about microwaves for a minute. Let's use real-world examples. When people get a piece of steak, like say you had a nice piece of steak, you didn't eat it all, you took it home, they put it in a box for you in Sydney, then you want to eat it the next day, you know, most people are going to go and heat it up in a microwave. If you don't heat it up the right way, the steak is going to taste like a piece of shoe leather. Why? Because what do microwaves do? They dehydrate the steak. Okay. So to make the steak work, you usually have to wet a paper towel, put the steak inside that, and then put it in the microwave. Then the steak retains some of its water. Well, you need to understand, wait a minute, what happens if I'm in a plane that goes from Sydney to Los Angeles four times a week. Who's the steak then? Because there's 250 
people in the plane using Wi-Fi flying 14 hours to get you to the West Coast. So it should be no shock why those people get more blood clots, have more disease. In other words, we just explained to you how by making a decision for your job or a decision for your travel could actually mimic what happens with the steak that you got left over from Sydney that you put in the microwave. Because I think everybody has had the experience that steak gets dehydrated when you heat it up improperly in a microwave. What they may not know is the reasons for that is when microwaves hit, protons in water makes them oscillate faster. It doesn't break the bonds. It just means they oscillate faster and that creates heat. The heat is what dehydrates the water from the food source. Realize that the exact same thing that's happening in a dead piece of cow is happening in your mitochondria when you stand in front of it to heat up your coffee every morning. Yeah. And and that was going to be um, my next question, which is how is the exposure or what is a mechanism, exact mechanism by which exposure to non-native EMF impairs the water production in mitochondria and therefore contributes to, to mitochondrial heteroplasmy and, and the development of disease? Well, I mean, there, that's a, a big loaded topic, but the, the first place you'd have to start is understand how water creation begins. There's four red light chromophores in cytochrome C oxidase. Cytochrome C oxidase, which is the fourth cytochrome, it's the one right before the ATPase. That's where most water production is done. Uh, those four, four red light chromophores actually link to all the, the pathways that are present in the mitochondrial matrix. That means protein metabolism, uh, the TCA cycle and glycolysis, those portions that are in there. So it turns out 620, 680, 760, and 860, those are the four red light chromophores. So I'm sure people who will be watching this on YouTube will have noticed since we've been talking an hour and a half, I've had the red light on. Why? Because we started the podcast at 5 a.m. my time. I'm sure I could probably open this now and the street lights off. The reason I closed this and let me open it now, Max, because I'd like to see if the sun's out. Uh, it should be sunrise already. And it is. It's close. So I will still leave the red light on. But you can see now there's different light. And I've taken my blue blocking glasses off. So you can see they really were blue blocking. The reason why I leave the red light on is because this glass right here actually filters, even though the sun, it hasn't come up yet, but it's, it's you know, the dawn. Um, and you can see this horrible blue light coming through there. This glass blocks 40 to 60% of the red from the sun. It also blocks all the UV, but it allows the blue light to pass through. So the reason I leave the interior light on me. Anytime you have excessive blue light, you need to add red to it. Now people may be beginning to understand the wisdom of this because it turns out the red light helps stimulate water production in your mitochondria. Turns out when you have unfettered blue light from LED light, from anything you plug into Tesla's power grid, it creates an EMF that dehydrates us. Now, the question you asked, because I'm not running away from it, is each part of the electromagnetic spectrum does different things to water. So for example, RF causes an oscillation of protons, meaning the protons start to move differently. Max learned about that when he went through radiology, because that's exactly how an MRI is generated. I already told you the answer for, for uh Mitochond I should say for microwaves, it actually causes rotations of uh, the atoms in water so that heat is created. The heat then causes evaporation of water much quicker. And if you get up to, say, gamma rays, gamma rays completely blow water apart. 
if we, we talk about x-rays, I think that's probably something that most people have an experience with. Like if you go to the dentist or you go to the doctor, they'll do x-rays on you. They usually want to shield you. The reason they're trying to shield you is to protect you from the radiation of the x-ray because soft x-rays also decrease water production from mitochondria. This is the reason why if you see radiated tissue for, say, cancer patients, it almost looks always scarred. It's devoid of mitochondria. Why? Because the mitochondria have been taken away. If you don't have mitochondria there, you can't make water. So each part of the electromagnetic spectrum has different effects on water production. And you need to understand that those different uh, levels of radiation are manifest in your mitochondria. Your mitochondria respond to electromagnetic radiation. This is why I call them an electromagnetic cipher that deciphers the code of the environment you're in to create the amount of water that you're going to get. The goal for you is to create as much water as you can. Turns out within the visible spectrum, that's when we produce the most water. So the best time for you to make water uh, is actually in the morning, which is right now for me. Max, right now, I'm sure it's probably 9, 10 o'clock. Uh, at night, he's in, I guess, Friday. I'm in Thursday. And for him, this podcast is more detrimental for him right now than it is for me because of the water production. Um, that's the key. And I want people to understand that when you understand water really, really well, understand water from a mitochondrial standpoint, that's how you limit disease. So the more things that you do in your life that decrease water production in you, the more times you're going to have to come see me and Max. Your yeah. goal is only to see me and Max when you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what you said, Jack, is so critical, I think, and important for understanding the harm of non-native EMF. Because again, in terms of the predominant paradigm, what we're, we're told is that ionizing radiation, what you'll get if you have an X-ray or you get exposed to you know, the, the waste products of a nuclear reactor or a nuclear weapon, that's ionizing radiation. We're told that that's the harmful stuff, but, no, but other no forms of radiation, um, the non-ionizing radiation, are not harmful to health other than the tissue heating effect. But what Jack has just told you... you, you need to, you need you need to understand though why we're being told this. It's because all of our economies are based on tech use. So if they told us the truth, you'd actually realize the real diet that we all need to go on is a tech diet, yeah. not a food diet. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why is because it, it correlates with how much water production we are. You know, so many people wax poetic about, oh, the carnivore diet so great or the EpiPaleo prescription is so great because it makes more water. Well, I got some bad news here. Uh, your laptop probably has a bigger effect on you than your diet does, which also makes me, you know, not too popular with the people who are food gurus. Why? Yeah. Because ultimately when we talk about non-native EMF, we're talking about light, but we're really, non-native EMF isn't just a light story. I think you're beginning to understand that it's really a light and water story. It's, it's those two concepts married together that lead to disease. Yeah. I, but I think what, what you've given the, the listener is a framework to understand exactly why leaving their Wi-Fi router on next to their head at night, leaving their phone charging next to their head at night um, is or, or standing in front of a microwave or putting their ear, AirPods, AirPods you know, in, into their ears, putting their their phone next to their genitals or in a bra that you're giving them a framework to understand why that is why, why that's harmful to health and it's well let's 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 make it even simpler max let's let's go back we've been doing this consistently for an hour and a half let's let's talk about our buddy from cupertino california steve jobs he's he's the analogy that replaces scott kelly here yeah. so what was he famous for well, he'd go out and give his Mac talks. He would turn around with his black turtleneck, and you'd see on his ass that he'd have in his Levi's a perfect spot where he used to put his iPhone. 
which is in the retro peritoneal space. Max, you can parse that out later and tell him what that means. But his pocket was so worn, you can see it in every video he's done. Then the second thing we need to discuss with our listeners here is who coined the term laptop? Anybody know? Oh, it's that guy, Steve Jobs. Why? Because he used to take this stupid thing right here, okay, and put it on his lap which meant that he had another electromagnetic device. And if it's plugged in charging, holy shit, that's even worse than when it's not because you make less water. But he put it here. So what happened to him? He died of a retroperitoneal cancer. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. And if you read his book, he said, I'm the most famous guy in the world, made the coolest products, which – I don't think anybody would argue with, but the funny thing is he wouldn't let his own kids use his own products. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. And then when you parse it out further, one of the key products that he was famous for was the iPad when he came back to Apple the second time. Did you know that the second generation iPad had an infrared detector in it, but they never marketed it? You want to know why? Because the infrared detector turned off the RF and microwave signal that you needed to connect because Steve Jobs knew that people would have that close to their body. And if it was there, they could limit, you know, some of the radiation exposure, kind of like what you do when you go to the dentist and they put a thyroid shield on you. And actually Steve Jobs knew this, but you know why Apple never marketed this cool thing? Because some of you would have wised up to what really was happening. You were making a trade of technology and progress for your time. This is a time trade. So the more tech you use, the more incorrectly, you are making a trade for time. Most of us do it for money. Um, a lot of people don't like to look at it like that. But what's the intermediary? What are you paying? You're paying your water. So this is the reason why people who use a lot of technology like to drink a lot of fluids. You know, Max knows this. He learned about it in diabetes. It's called polydipsia or polyuria. The last one is polyphagia. What you'll find, especially if you read my blogs, I just described to you what diabetes is. Well, we now know that people that use technology, they tend to get way more diabetes. The other thing that's kind of interesting, we have these charts in the United States called NHANES charts. That's N-H-A-N-E-S. Max knows about them. He can parse them for you later. I'm not interested in talking about them, but this is what I am interested in talking about. Every 10% of tech spending in the United States leads to 10% rise of obesity in the United States. Huh. That's interesting. Well, based on what I told you in the last podcast, maybe you know why. Because that leptin milano cortin pathway, which goes right past the hypothalamus that makes something called vasopressin, which controls what, Max? Water flow and water balance in your body? Hold on. Jack, did you just explain to us why technology and water and heteroplasmy and disease are all linked? You're damn right I did. I yeah. want you to understand, since we've been going for about an hour and a half, and I can't go much longer because I have to go make rounds in that place over there to go see the people that came in last night. I just want you to understand how these things all link together. You know, maybe we'll do another one of these in the next couple of days where we can get into maybe some of the cooler parts of the water story uh, because – one of the things I, I want people to really understand, because I think we've done a good job here laying the base case, I want all of you to remember, look in nature, look outside, see how water is being used around you, and then think about yourself, okay? There's a, a pretty famous guy uh, that I, I stumbled upon uh, because most people who follow me know that I like to look back to learn what we've missed. His name is Victor Schoberger, okay? He was a German scientist around when the Nazis were around. And uh, when I talked about POMC and light last time, I, I mentioned a, a Russian scientist 
uh, named Alexander Gerwich, who's the guy that figured out that mitogenic radiation uh, stimulated mitosis. And that turned out to be a big story for melanin in the body. Well, the reason I mentioned Schoberger, because maybe the next time we do a discussion about water, we start to talk about what Schoberger found, because what Schoberger found in nature actually explains some of the things that happened in us. For example, he stood at a, a brook along the Rhine River and saw fish stand motionless in a river with current and had no problems doing it. And this stunned him. Like he said, I got to figure out how this works. So he did. And it turns out when I originally learned about his work, I thought about it. Uh, and I remember visiting a place on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and seeing how they brought logs from the top of the volcano all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. And the guy told me how it worked. And th the guy mentioned Victor Schoberger again. He said, yeah, we use implosion technology in water to help us do this. And when I looked into that, I realized immediately this is the exact same thing that the human heart uses in the circulatory system. The reason I'm bringing this up is not to end on this, but to be provocative. Hopefully, some of you will listen to the end of this podcast and go, well, he just gave us a name. I'm going to go start doing some homework and read about this because this still is a water story. Water, we talked about the basics of water. We haven't got into how water is used at the macro level and how it changes at the micro level. There's there's a lot more to this water story than you want to know. Yeah. And because I, this podcast is about fertility, I really want to emphasize one point. And Jack, you tell me if I speak at, at a turn. But when you put your device next to your, your phone or your iPhone in your pocket next to your testicles uh, or your ovaries, you're essentially exposing them to sources of non-native EMF that are impairing their, your, the mitochondria of your Sertoli cells and your other testicular cells to make mitochondrial water. You're, in, you're increasing the mitochondrial heteroplasmy of your testicular cells and you're causing epigenetic changes that are going to be passed on to your children and your children's children. So all that to say, you're directly... You just described the, the modern way of recapitulating the Scott Kelly uh, experiment. Yeah. The, the way you do it is just put your iPhone next to your head, put the iPhone in your bra. Yeah. That's exactly what Scott Kelly did by going up in space. It's exactly what travelers do who take circumpolar flights. Yeah. They don't even realize they're doing it. Um, but see, that's the key thing. I'm not technically... I'm doing it right now by standing behind this glass. See, these are all little effects that we need to understand the trade-off that we're making. I, I try to use Steve Jobs to explain it as well. When you begin to understand it, that's part of the reason why you'll see when I do podcasts, I never put anything in my ears. Why? Because I value the melanin in my cochlea, but I really value my temporal lobes. Uh, and... I refuse to use them. I will not use them. I don't care if it sounds bad or not. Why? Uh, you know, as much as I like getting the information out, I like me better than I like you. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Well, th this is for you the have listeners. to take care of. It. This is for the listeners. I've got these in for the listeners. So, um, one one quick question: You mentioned black swan mitochondria. Is that a homage to Nassim Taleb, or where where did you get the black swan from? Yeah, well, the black swan actually comes from two things. Uh, number one, they're rare in the United States. I, f I found out after I coined the term that they're not so rare in other parts of the world. So there it doesn't hit home. But the other thing that's important is uh, black swan is a tail event. And if you remember what we talked about in the last podcast, everything that I told you in the last podcast tells you that mammals are uh, – a tail event uh, story. We, yeah. we are so different than most other parts of life. Why? Because we actually create glucose from light directly. And then we actually have a system in us, which we talked about today, 
to actually break it down. We are a fully contained organism that really is built uh, for how we came into this world and dominated, which was an interruption of photosynthesis. That, that was our superpower. It still remains our superpower, but we're not realizing what we talked about today. If you parse all the words that Max and I got out, we're building a case for you that we're creating our own asteroid now. Why? Because we're dehydrating ourselves. See, the T-Rexes got taken out from an extraterrestrial event that wiped out their food source. It uh, turns out our food source, really, if you're really paying attention to what we're saying here, is water. And we create it. We create it a variety of different ways. We create it not only endogenously, but also exogenously. And it turns out that that creation of water is absolutely paramount to a mammal. And it turns out when you're a mammal that has a Ferrari engine, that big ball of gas in the, the sky actually is critical to you making the water in you. Um, and when you begin to understand how these pieces fit, then you'll have a way better idea about how things go. And, and, you know, I know most of your listeners are probably in Australia. Hopefully they're realizing the things that we're saying in between our words are really important. This is the reason why sunglasses, slathering that crap on you guys, that you guys do down there. Um, you know, because I since we did the first podcast, I've had several Australians come on Twitter and tell me, you know, that, oh, there's there's a good case for for uh, sunscreen. In fact, one of your friends that hooked us up, Jake Woodhouse, who I did a podcast with Bitcoin, he's, he came up with an idea that, oh, I'm going to make a, a cheap sunscreen. I'm like, dude, I, I responded to him today when you were sleeping. I said, there is no good sunscreen. The only good sunscreen is the sunscreen that's built by histidine in our skin. You know, it's called uricolic acid. You, you already come fully loaded with what you need. Understand that stop trying to use your frontal lobes to create something that's causing collateral damage that's going to bring you to Max's office or my office. I mean, nature is way smarter than any human that's ever walked on this planet. That's something I can tell you is axiomatically true. Yeah. This is why I always tell my black swans to comprehend and then copy nature. That's much better than following lemmings off a cliff on a podcast yeah and uh, i did read that thread uh, after i woke up and to play devil's advocate or to give an idea i'd say okay jack well what about when i'm on a glacier what am i what about when i'm on a ski slope what what if i'm sailing in the middle of the ocean in in, in the brightest sunlight so surely i uh, i could use a bit of a sunscreen you, there. you already you already did you, you already did your sunscreen it's called clothing there's your answer for why would you put anything else why would you put anything else on you know those things i mean not only that i mean just think about what lions and hippos do when they when they get too much sunlight they go in the shade or they look for shelter somewhere you're capable of doing that the the point is don't put any foreign chemicals on your body it's as simple as that you're not designed for any of that crap, uh, you, you are designed to make your own protection systems. And, you know, animals seem to, to know implicitly when they go in. They, the only animals they get human diseases are the ones that we put in zoos. Yeah. Why? Because what light are they under? They're not under sunlight. So, but what, I mean, snow blindness, like you will get snow blind if you, if you don't shield your eyes on a glacier. I mean, that's. The, the right. question then is, but what are you doing on a glacier? Max, well, I'm, I'm going to make this even simpler for you. Isn't that the same situation that Scott Kelly faced? Are humans designed to go up in space for 340 days? No, they're not. So you're not designed to be on a glacier for a long period of time either. Yeah, that's the answer. Yeah. It's, it's as simple as that. The, the question is, when you're there, I'm okay with you protecting yourself, but realize that you're not designed to be there yeah. for a long period of time. Isn't that an electromagnetic mismatch as well? Of course it is. It's the same thing about being on a boat. <clears throat> but I would still tell you, would I use a chemical tarp 
No, I would not. Um, am I okay with different protection schemes there? Like your hat, your clothing, you know, if you want to use sunglasses after you've been on the glacier for a period of time, I don't have a problem with that. That's not the point. See, humans are stupid because these, these things that you're talking about, they want to generalize them. Oh, well, I, if I can wear them on a glacier, I can wear them anywhere. No, you can't. And the reason why you can't is because your RP in your eye says you can't. Yeah. Okay. And understand that. Um, I think that's that's really the key. Yeah. The key is I want you to get the bigger points so that you can hammer them home and get them right. Um, you you are built by nature to be amazing. I mean, I, that's the case that I think I try to lay out in three hours before. You know, we're an hour and 45 minutes into this one. Um, I want you to begin to understand that you, ha you have amazing capabilities inside you if you would just get your frontal lobes out of your own way. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. Water is not that hard to understand. It really isn't. Um, what makes it a little bit more difficult is when you introduce these environmental variables, you know, that you've wanted to introduce now. Yeah. Well, I, I think we've done a, a, a pretty uh, fascinating and interesting journey in terms of water um, and how it links into light. And that, that those are the first two, two uh, legs of the stool of, um, of this, this whole series. So, a lot that we haven't covered, and as you said, maybe we'll, we'll get on and record something to finish the kind of water story on before we move to magnetism. But any final kind of tie-up thoughts that you want to end this uh, podcast on? No, I would just tell people, that, keep asking questions. If you listen to this podcast and there's questions that, you know, come to you, don't, don't keep listening to the podcast. Hit pause, write them down. And then put them either on your YouTube channel, put, put them on Max's Twitter, you know, ask those questions. Um, you need to learn about this stuff. This stuff isn't critically important because I believe that you have a decentralized doctor inside your own head. That doctor needs to be educated um, so that you're fully capable of making your own decisions, you know. <clears throat> Humans prior to 5,000 years ago never went to doctors. And yet we're here as proof that humans can live in nature without centralized healthcare. Realize nature is unmatched in her success. Um, and also realize that since we have centralized healthcare, especially in developing countries like Australia and the United States, that uh, at least in the United States, the study has been done. Doctors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. That should scare the shit out of you. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that we're bad. Um, there are certain things we are worse at, and it turns out chronic disease management is one of them. We're really good at the stuff that I have to go and make rounds at, which is, you know, acute traumatic events. Um, I just don't want people to be scared, even when you don't think you're an expert in something. I think. If you have a beginner's mindset, that uh, that's kind of how I guess we we did this podcast with water. We didn't even get into the physical changes of water with light. We didn't get into some of Schoberger stuff. We didn't. We certainly didn't talk about vortexing water and what Richard Feynman had to say about that, and how magnetism actually links to water, and how this all links to the Schumann resonance. I mean. There's a lot still left to talk about, um, but this is the basics. I think when you understand the basics, you begin to realize, hey, water is is a key thing, and the, the the amount of water we produce is more important than the water we drink. The production of water in a mammal is critical, and we'll we'll end it on that, and we'll pick this thread up in a future podcast. So, Jack, thank you so much for your time, and thanks to the listeners for tuning in and looking forward to to picking this up and talking again soon. All right, sounds good. Take care.